um, hello everyone my name is malin tamar singh and uh, here i am with my colleague uh, tilini shanika and uh, we'll be the host of the webinar webinar today and we both are member of members of uh, wso2 api manager team working as associate technical leads and now today's topic is api security in a cloud native era so um, before going to security in cloud native uh, let's look at what is cloud native and uh, why people are increasingly choose cloud native application approach uh, for uh, building enterprise applications and uh, in the first phase of uh, cloud adoption uh, many companies use uh, lift and shift approach and it's uh, basically the existing on premise applications were migrated to cloud with uh, little or no modification and that delivered an initial burst of benefits um, earlier organizations uh, spend a significant portions of their time and effort managing infrastructure uh, provisioning configuring and uh, managing resources and etc and uh, there are lots of decision points to make as for uh, scaling up or down uh, on provisioning and etc uh, but uh, after moving to cloud there is no more cost for purchasing and managing infrastructure and enterprises could just automate these decision points um, but however there are there's still the potential for doing uh, much more stuff basically uh, those enterprise applications are built as uh, monolithic applications as a single unit and often with uh, three main parts uh, like uh, client side html pages and javascript running in the browser on uh, user's machine and uh, again a database and uh, again a server side application and such a, a monolithic server is a natural way for uh, natural kind of way of uh, building such a system earlier uh, and uh, these monolithic applications were kind of successful uh, but uh, uh, increasingly people started uh, feeling frustrated like uh, especially as more applications are deployed to the cloud um, uh, changes are tied together a lot for example uh, if you want to change a small part of the application uh, you need you need to um, kind of uh, build, rebuild and be, redeploy the entire application. And if you want to scale it, uh, you should scale the entire application rather than pass of that. So that requires lots of resources and most part of that, those resources uh, and will be just wasted. So, um, for, uh, so many organizations actually wanted a different ap approach. So that is what actually paved the way for building applications as a suite of uh, microservices. So each running those, each, each microservice is running in its, uh, in its own process and uh, communicating with lightweight mechanisms such as HTTP. And those can be developed and deployed and managed independently. And from that, uh, one should be able to introduce a change to a service and test it and instantly uh, deploy it in, uh, it in in production without affecting any other services. And um, and, it, and also it provides enhanced uh, extensibility and also security. And for any organization, it is very important to remain competitive and by, so it is by adding new features to existing products. So for that, uh, it is, uh, necessary to have an architecture that is extensible and robust enough uh, and kind of robust enough to support changes without risking existing stuff and if you build applications as loosely coupled lightweight services then you can add or update new modules without having to rebuild the entire applications so it avoids the risk of massive failures as well um, but however there are some challenges still we have to face when building microservices based applications so we'll go through that first so um, compared to the monolithic approach uh, in a microservice in a microservice based application there are lots of entry points and in a monolithic they are about around tens and but in the microservices world it becomes hundreds of endpoints and even it can be even higher 
higher than that. So each endpoint uh, should have some sort of uh, security screening to avoid unauthorized access. And the performance is also a concern as there can be many remote calls. And if, if you are trying to implement a security mechanism, it, sh uh, it should not add, add any unwanted overhead as well. And again, how do we share the user context? A microservice might talk to few other microservices to perform uh, some functionalities. So then uh, the other microservices might need to know who the user, who is the actual user that the request is originated from. So for that, uh, the microservice, microservices should have some sort of a secure way uh, to pass the user context between uh, each and every microservices uh, in the flow. So uh, also there are other challenges like observability and deployment aspects as well. Uh, so uh, the problem. So we can understand um, we need to be mindful of the security aspects on on each and every microservice. Uh, but the problem. So should we really implement this as part of each and every microservice? And Obviously, I, uh, so it is not a good thing uh, to do. So actually, uh, the intention of a microservice is to perform on perform one and only one business function. So actually, uh, if we add multiple stuff, the microservice will deviate from its original intention. So we need we need is a way to delegate the authentication process to an external entity. So that is where the API gateway comes to the picture. So the API gateway will front all the externally exposable uh, microservices and it can handle all the inbound authentication fun functionalities from the external world. So the request will be passed to the internal microservices only if the flow from the gateway is succeeded. So therefore the microservices doesn't need to worry about those security related aspects and can only focus about its business logic. And the, the gateway also provide a single entry point for the for the whole system of um, microservices to the external users. Then, uh, so because of that, the client doesn't need to keep track of each and every microservices URLs, and the uh, the clients only need to remember only about the gateway endpoint URL. And uh, the gateway in this context uh, should be responsible for uh, three main tasks. And the uh, first thing is uh, authentication and authorizing, authorization. Uh, the gateway needs to enforce uh, some sort of a key or a token based validation to all the incoming requests so that uh, it can make sure the requests are done by the legitimate users only. And uh, further, uh, even if the token is valid, uh, there can be like uh, malicious data in the payload so that uh, it can harm the system. So for, for example, there can be uh, injection attacks, there can be denial of service or DOS attacks. The gateway uh, should be, is a, again another responsibility of the gateway uh, to, to prevent those kind of attacks as well. And, uh, but still, even though both of these uh, keys and payload contents looks okay, it's still that the things can, there are possibilities that the things can go wrong. For example, uh, the someone can someone can steal someone else's connection and try to perform uh, illegal action on the other users, uh, in, uh, like the other user. And uh, the gateway, a gateway, again, that is another kind of uh, a, a responsibility to detect uh, those kind those types of abnormal events and those types of attacks and prevent them from harming the ex harming the system and the data and existing users and do kind of proper alerting to relevant authorities so and uh, so we will discuss each of these three points uh, during the next slides of the webinar and so we'll first uh, discuss about api authentication and uh, authorization uh, so the APIs are mostly exposed to external users uh, who are not actually part of the system. And in a typical uh, API ecosystem, uh, there are at least three types of parties that are involved to run the system. And for example, at the first step, 
let's say the API developer can develop the API and makes it available to external parties. And then uh, there are application developers uh, who can discover the APIs created by these uh, API developers and they can build kind of a beautiful application on top of this API and uh, using another APIs from other when other API, API developers as well. Let's say like uh, let's say he uh, develop a mobile application and put it to an app store and then uh, let's say some user browsing through the app store and sees that application downloads that and install it and start using it so uh, to support this scenario so there are uh, three types of users and the you there should be some sort of a way to delegate the end users the app the application users credential to the application in the secure way so basically uh, um, so there, this is where uh, we need a better type better kind of better type of authentication uh, other than like uh, basic authentication so the basic basic authentication uh, it is uh, it's not really a secured approach because then when when we are use basic authentication the user need to provide its own credential to the application so the the user should be then in that case the user should be able to trust the application but that in this case the the application is also uh, developed by a, again a, by a third party so so that that uh, authentication approach is not a suitable approach for this scenario so so this is kind of where uh, auth2 authentication comes to the picture so basically auth2 is currently the de facto standard for api security so it specified uh, different different types of grants to support various use cases so depending on the use case we can choose which grant types to enforce so for the scenario i mentioned there are uh, there are, there are three users involved and we can choose the authorization code grant so uh, we'll discuss about that in uh, in later slide and uh, there are two common types of tokens which are self-contained access tokens uh, based on jwt's and reference tokens uh, which is just a string of characters so the, so those two types of tokens are kind of common for or to base authorization authentication and uh, so so we'll discuss about these two tokens so uh, from these two tokens from these two token types it is important to highlight about uh, self-contained type access tokens uh, based on jwt's so so this is actually a best fit for microservice world so the importance of uh, jwt based uh, or to access token is that uh, they can be validated without calling any external party party and uh, it is also integrity protected by uh, signing using a shared secret or a public private key pair uh, uh, a typical jwt token looks like the below string in the slide and so so it's like it's basically a long kind of string uh, but it contains three parts so it is the header uh, which is the red, red segment and the next segment is the payload and the other the 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 next segment is the signature so those are three json strings uh, which are base64 encoded so on the right side uh, you can see a sample decoded jwt token and in the payload uh, it can include all the required user information so that the gateway can use those information for validating the user and uh, do the authentication process uh, so this is the flow of the self uh, self-contained access token op obtaining so as the first step the user will be uh, redirected to the authorization server where he would uh, enter the credentials and approve the application and then at the end the application can get a jwt token so once it invokes once the application invokes the api uh, from the jwt token the gateway can validate it by itself without talking to any external party and uh, 
in uh, contrast to uh, self-contained token the reference the reference tokens need to be validated by calling the authorization server and so this would engage an extra network call so this is what uh, represent like uh, introspect in the slide uh, between microservice and the, which is the uh, resource uh, which is the gateway or and the authorization server and uh, so actually this would engage an extra network call in microservice world uh, we try to avoid uh, unnecessary network calls as much as possible so that is why JWTs are advantages over OPAC or reference access tokens. Uh, okay, so now uh, we look at several O2 grant types. So actually, grant types uh, represent different different types of ways an application can get an access token. Um, Parser grant is uh, the one is one of the simplest among them. So the user just need to provide his uh, auth server credentials uh, directly to the client application and uh, then the client application does an access token request by directly passing the user's credentials which is passed by the user uh, directly to the authorization server and for this the user should be able to fully trust the application so that is the problem with this approach and so because of that the this grant type can be used only when the client application and the host server belongs to the same entity otherwise the user can't be the user cannot trust that the client application will protect this uh, or um, protect the uh, credentials from of the user from which is taken from which uh, which is uh, from the host server so so because of that uh, this should never be used in uh, Client, when the client application is from a different party than the authorization server's domain. Okay, so in contrast to password grant, uh, authorization code grant is more appropriate uh, when the client is uh, third party than the authorization server. So here, the user always provides his credentials to the authorization server, not to the application. Uh, like previously and then after some couple of redirect flows so this is the the authorization code grant is based on redirects so after this couple of redirections the client can obtain the client application can obtain an access token so basically uh, this is suitable for traditional web applications where uh, both server side and client side components are present in the application and the, the access token can be kept internal to the server component uh, and uh, so then that, that access token can even be kept without exposing it to the user to the user's use agent so in this case uh, the use agent and the application can have session based authentication and then the application and the apis can have the access token based authentication the access token which was uh, obtained by the authorization code grant and so this is the uh, detailed flow uh, of the authorization code grant and as the first step the resource owner or the end user uh, will access the application and then the application will redirect the user to the authorization server so so that is the second step and uh, so at the authorization server uh, the user will provide the credentials and authorize the application and after that the auth server will redirect the user to the application with an auth code and um, so then the uh, so then what we can so then the what the application can do is that it can do an internal api call to the token api of the auth server using the obtained code uh, from the previous flow uh, to generate an access token so now this access token can be used by the application to invoke the required required apis uh, but uh, this normal authorization code grant is not a good suit for public applications so which can't be trusted so basically uh, uh, the, the the reason is that uh, it cannot keep the credentials in a secure way. Credential means uh, application credentials. 
your auth application credentials so even if uh, let's say if we take an example like a mo mobile application uh, it can also be uh, decompiled and extract the credentials and hack the code things like so we uh, people can do things like that so because of that authorization code grant uh, uh, without the client secret can be used but uh, however the bet uh, the better practice is that to use a PKCE along with authorization code grant. So uh, the reason is that uh, the authorization code received by the application are often uh, vulnerable to authorization code grant interception attack. So this is a, this uh, this uh, diagram represents a typical flow of that. Uh, for example, like uh, a Mac. A malicious application can be registered in the system with the same URI as the legitimate application, like the legitimate or to application, and then there is a chance that uh, the authorization code is passed to the malicious application from the opera, from the authorized system or the browser, and so then the malicious application can get the authorization code. So 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 in the previous flow in the previous authorization code flow so what the client requires is just the authorization code and then it can get get an access token so so this problem is there in normal authorization code grant without using the client secret and so in order to avoid that uh, the pkca the pkce mechanism use an extra uh, challenge and verification based mechanism uh, so in contrast to dip, uh, the typical authorization code flow uh, the client application need to additionally provide a client uh, additionally provide uh, a challenge string and a method when calling the authorized endpoint and the authorization server will store that challenge and uh, during and then after during the token request the application is required to provide another input called verifier so then the authorization server will check whether the verifier and the challenge matches uh, the challenge which was sent earlier matches before granting an access token so so the important point is that the verifier is only known to the application up to this point so it is only known to the application up to this point and then without that uh, no one else can get an access token by uh, providing the auth authorization code. So the uh, so in in simple words, the even if they steal the authorization code, they can't get they can't do anything using that authorization code because they don't know the verifier. So only the very the verifier the verifier is only known to the leg legitimate application. So right. So uh, we talk in detail about. Uh, authorization code flow and uh, related extension and uh, which is uh, commonly used these days uh, and uh, so continuing the grant types so basically uh, there are a uh, few other grant types available which are client credentials implicit uh, jwt grant and summer bear grant and uh, the client credential is another simple type simple grant type which can be used when where the requirement is only for client authentication and this can be used in basically uh, server to server communication processes and implicit grant was earlier used for uh, public public clients like uh, single page applications and mobile apps but uh, due to security concern now it is uh, deprecated so the, re the reason is that when using when we are using in, uh, implicit grants the access tokens are sent from the url so anyone uh, who has access to the URL can see the access token and so that is a, a security problem and so now the recommended approach over implicit grant is to use authorization code with PKCE so uh, so so, the, so as I explained earlier so uh, now uh, we look into O2 scopes uh, so also O2 scopes will enable fine-grained access control to API resources. So the API resources can be protected with those two scopes so that uh, it will make sure that the only allowed parties have access to 
those respective resources. And on the other hand, uh, the scope can be again used for grant only a subset of users' capabilities to access token. From that, as the, the application can only perform those activities on behalf of users. Uh, so uh, then the user can ensure that the application will use the token only for the intended purpose right so now uh, i invite Tilini to perform a small demo and uh, continue the next part of the webinar okay thank you malinta so uh so let's have a quick demonstration on how we can secure an api in api manager uh, via o2 and manage uh, different levels of access control using uh, o2 scopes so uh here uh, i'm going to discuss some uh, user scenarios in an inventory management system so, as an example so uh, in an inventory management system uh, there are different types of users such as uh, store managers salespersons, buyers, etc. with uh, different levels of privileges. So in this example, we have an API to manage products in the in inventory. Basically, uh, the API is to add new products uh, to the inventory and get in uh, retrieve uh, the API uh, uh, product in, in, retrieve the product information. So uh, Bob is a store manager. Uh, with high privileges and he has access to a uh, product at API resource Meanwhile, he can retrieve uh, the product information uh, as well uh, But Alice she's a salesperson with less privileges She has uh, the access to product API, but uh, she product API to retrieve API, uh, product details, but she cannot add new products to uh, the inventory management system so let's see how we can uh, implement this type of uh, use case using uh, WS2 API manager uh, or, or scopes so in, in here I have already uh, exposed this uh, product API or inventory management API in API manager so if you uh, So if you go to uh, the resources of the API, you can see there are two resources. Uh, product post resource is to add new products to the system. And product get resource is to retrieve uh, the existing product information. So uh, our requirement is to restrict this product add API to store managers only. So for that, we need to use scopes so I would navigate to a uh, scopes tab in here I have already added a scope named at products and I have rest I have assigned uh, the scope role as store manager so uh, which means uh, this particular uh, scope is uh, restricted to store manager users only so I'll go back to resources tab and if I expand the product post API resource you can see that I have signed at products API scope to this particular uh, resource which means uh, this particular resource will be accessed by uh, the user group which has uh, uh, so management privileges so uh, our API is ready so let's log in log into the dev portal So this is where uh, this is the consumers portal where they can come and discover for API. Now you can see that inventory management API is there. So I would log into uh, the dev portal as uh, first I need to log out as get me. I have logged in as Bob. Now I would go to the API overview. And here you have a section called credentials. This is where we manage uh, the API uh, credentials. Basically, if you want to access an API uh, in API Manager, first you need to create an application and generate tokens against it. So I have already completed that part. So I have subscribed. Uh, 
sub subscribe uh, this particular user uh, using this inventory management application. So I would go to uh, the production keys of that app. So now I'm going to generate an access token to access this API. So if you go to uh, generate access, if you click on the access token uh, button, you can see uh, you, you will be prompted to give the validation period along with uh, the scopes that you need to uh, obtain uh, the token with. So if you click on the drop down, you can see that uh, the, the scope that we have specified uh, at uh, API publishing time is uh, listed here. So I would uh, request this scope when generating the access token. Now uh, uh, I was able to generate an access token successfully. Uh, this is a self-contained access token which comes in uh, JWT format. So if you if you see uh, the scope list, the uh, the scope list uh, comes with this application. You can see that add product scope is listed uh, in in the uh, scope list. So which means this token has been issued with this particular scope. So I would uh, copy this token and I would decode it for you. Now you can see this is the decoded token. Uh, in this token, you can uh, find all the information, uh, all the user attributes of the do uh, of uh, the use uh, the user, which means Bob, apart from uh, the scopes which has been uh, which has been comes with uh, issued with this token. Yeah, here, yeah. like so. I have already copied this token. Now let's try to invoke our product at API resource. So I have invoked the API. Now you can see uh, the Bob was able to successfully invoke this API because uh, he has uh, the required privileges to invoke it because he has the correct correct uh, the signed uh, role uh, in the score. Now I'm going to log out from this session and log in as Alice. So as I have explained earlier, Alice is a less privileged user. She only has access to product uh, information retrieval uh, API resource. She can't uh, add products to the system. So let's see whether we can um, prohibit uh, that particular API access via scopes. So here, like, like I did earlier, I'm going to generate an access token for Alice. And here I'm going to request uh, API product scope. Now you can see uh, in this particular token has been issued with these scopes, but you, you can see that uh, at product scope is not listed here. We only have default scope. Anyway, let's copy this uh, token and see whether she can invoke that particular API. I'm going to copy the token here. So I'm going to invoke it as okay. Now you can see she she is prohibited. She the the API access is uh, forbidden. The API resource access is prohibited. Uh, forbidden because she does not have enough privileges. But uh, if you invoke API, uh, the product uh, information retrieval API, okay, she got the response. 
Okay, uh, that's how um, O2 and O2 scopes uh, can be used to uh, manage access control and authentication in API. API. So let's uh, go back to uh, the slide deck. So apart from uh, O2, uh, there are some other mechanisms of uh, protecting uh, the API. Um, API keys is one uh, one of those mechanics, mechanisms where we uh, we can uh, use a system generate unique random string for authentication. Basically, uh, the the gate the uh, this particular token uh, is uh, shared between API client and gateway only, and uh, the API client is expected to provide the key at uh, invocation time for the authentication uh, basic authentication so uh, basic authentication in basic authentic, uh, authentication the api request is sent with uh, authorization header uh, that contains the word basic followed by base 64 encoded username password so uh, these type of authentication mechanisms are recommended to use over a secure channel uh, because uh, uh, there are some uh, uh, while well, this can be easily, if, if the token is, if, if uh, API key is lost uh, and uh, if uh, there's a uh, credential breaching, this kind of uh, mechanisms won't fit into the picture. So mutual TLS. In mutual TLS, uh, the API client to gateway and uh, gateway to API client identity is proved via certificates. Here, uh, the client initiates the flow and tries to access the protected microservice or the API. Then the service or uh, the gateway sends the gateway certificate to the client and client validates the identity and builds the trust against the gateway. So likewise, the client proves its identity and the gateway builds the trust against the client. So uh, after after this process, uh, the both parties build the, the trust uh, against uh, each of them. And uh, after that, the protected resource access will be granted to the client. So um, in practice, it is recommended to use uh, the combination of the security mechanism. For example, uh, basic authentication, uh, if we enable basic authentication for a given API, um, it's better to enable TLS uh, to enforce both application and server level security. Uh, API access control can be managed via applying different types of access control policies. So uh, embedding authorization rules at service level uh, is not a good practice because it might uh, bring some extra burden uh, at the service level. Oh, and the recommended approach is to handle uh, the authorization decision uh, via a PDP or a policy decision point. Uh, open policy a engine, um, it is a lightweight general purpose engine that enforces this authorization at gateway or microservice level. Uh, this follows the embedded PDP approach and this can be integrated as a library or a sidecar uh, or a host, uh, hosted daemon. Uh, okay, so if we talk about propagating trust and user identity uh, to the backend, so uh, for example, if you take uh, for example, uh, there can be some uh, backends or microservices uh, which uh, expect to uh, send the user context uh, context for uh, internal authentication and uh, to perform their business functionalities. So basically, if the API is authenticated at the gateway, still these microservices need uh, to know uh, what are uh, what is the user context of this API, user con context of uh, this authenticated user to perform uh, maybe uh, internal service-to-service -service communication and for, uh, to perform some business uh, logic uh, implemented within the service level. Uh, Okay, so uh, so in such cases, uh, 
JWT or JSON Web Token can be used to propagate user identity and entitlements uh, from API Gateway to actual backends. So this is how it works. Now let's take uh, the previous example, uh, the Bob. Uh, first, uh, Bob invokes uh, an API uh, through API Gateway. It's uh, he, he, he sends the access token uh, with the uh, API request. Then API Gateway talks to an authorization server uh, to introspect. And if the authentication is successful, uh, a JWT will be generated from the authorization server and it will be sent with uh, intros introspection result uh, to, the, uh, to the Gateway. So, uh, then uh, we can configure uh, the API gateway to send this particular J, uh, JW2 backend. So, uh, so once uh, this JWT is passed to the backend uh, with the outgoing request, uh, the backend service can use this JWT to uh, uh, to step to um, authenticate uh, internal services. Uh, using signature verification. So other than that, um, the, this. So if you take this, um, if you look at the right side of this slide, you can see uh, a decoded uh, JWT, a format of a decoded JWT. So if you take the payload, you can see that um, authenticated username uh, and some other um, user attributes are there. So uh, the backend microservices, so uh, any other APIs can use this information uh, to, pro to uh, work with their um, internal business logic. So, uh, so in previous slides, uh, Malinta uh, has been talking about Malaysian, malicious contents. Uh, and uh, how we can uh, protect uh, our APIs against malicious contents. So I would, uh, so basically APIs are uh, frequently subjected to different types of cyber attacks, uh, which come in uh, the form of malicious contents. So basically uh, the attackers uh, tend to identify weak points and vul vulnerabilities of, of an API and they try to exploit them uh, by attacking uh, the whole system using malicious contents. So it is important to enhance the pro threat protection against this type of attacks. So um, we have, uh, for example, we have different types of uh, attacks which are related to malicious content. For example, uh, there can be SQL injection, XML bombs, for SEO passing, those are very commonly known uh, malicious content related attacks. So if you take regular, uh, we can actually, we can apply uh, different uh, types of threat protection mechanism to get rid of this type of attacks. So first one is uh, regular expression uh, based threat protection. Basically, uh, re regular expression threat protection can be used to prevent different types of injection attacks, such as uh, SQL injection, XPath, or JavaScript, JavaScript uh, based in injections. So, if you take uh, SQL injection, uh, a malicious SQL statement is inserted into an in um, uh, entry field of a database query and can be used to attack the database by spoofing uh, the identity or tampering the existing data. So this type of attacks are identified by a regex pattern uh, defined at the gateway. So apart from that, we can use uh, XML schema validations uh, to detect XML, uh, malicious XML content such as uh, XML bombs, um, which attacks the system by overloading the XML parser. Uh, in addition to that, uh, schema poisoning, coercive passing, uh, external entity attacks, those type of uh, attacks uh, can be uh, also prevented by schema validation, XML based schema validation. So likewise, uh, the JSON schema validation uh, also can be used, uh, can be applied at the gateway level to enable protection against uh, buffer overflow and coercive passing. Uh, 
So uh, the validations are based on predefined uh, JSON schema and payload machines such as max array size, max element size. size. So, uh, so the other type of uh, security mechanism is uh, uh, detecting abnormal activity patterns and uh, uh, enable some alerts and uh, termination based on uh, those pattern, pattern detection. So let's talk about it. Um, even though we uh, enforce security of, an, uh, of, uh, of the API using API authentication, access level, or threat protection against malicious content, still we can't guarantee that everything is okay. Because uh, there can be some other attacks which might come, come as valid request, but still capable of harming uh, the, the system. Okay, uh, so these are some of those uh, advanced cyber attacks. Um, account take over, login attacks, um, DDoS, uh, data injection. Those are, uh, those are that type of advanced attacks. So for example, uh, a hacker can attack an API using a stolen credential of a valid user. So, but still the system does not know that this is this is uh, an access from a stolen credential, but still it will, the system will uh, continue serving uh, that uh, stole, uh, serve uh, the APIs, uh, API traffic uh, for that particular stolen um, credential access also. So uh, this type of uh, abnormal activities cannot be easily identified at the gateway level or at the service level. And uh, basically, this type of uh, patterns uh, can only be identified by uh, maybe machine learning algorithms or artificial intelligence, uh, artificial, artificial intelligence or uh, stat-based uh, analysis. But uh, that kind of uh, complex uh, logics cannot be implemented at the gate at the service level. So, uh, but uh, we have different types of uh, artificial intelligent engines which are capable of uh, de detecting this type of abnormal activities. So we can hand over uh, the detection part to artificial uh, intelligent uh, engines and, uh, and, and then basically once uh, Basically, we can integrate that kind of um, engine with, with gateway, and uh, so if if the engine engine detects some abnormal patterns, it will notify the gateway. Then we can either either we can um, alerts uh, we can generate alerts uh, for uh, authorized parties or terminate uh, request access uh, request uh, serving based on uh, those patterns. So, uh, so for example, uh, if you take W3 API Gateway, uh, we can plug in um, uh, artificial intelligent engines such as Ping Intelligent to uh, handle this kind of pattern detection. Uh, then, like, so because uh, other than that, uh, we can have some in inbuilt. Uh, if we if we get if we can analyze uh, API stats, and we can have some inbuilt alerting systems to analyze these stats and generate uh, alerts on that. So uh, actually, uh, that is all uh, that we uh, intended to discuss uh, during today's webinar. Uh, so uh, long, we do have some upcoming webinars in our W API Manager 3.0 webinar series. Um, so we invite you to invite you to join them as well. Uh, now it is time for the Q and A session. Uh, we would like to invite you to uh, raise any can ask any questions if you have. Uh, we have a one question regarding uh, the access token and JWT token. I will read out the question for you. 
So um, what is the difference between access token with JWT token? Basically, uh, JWT token itself is an access token. So only difference is uh, JWT is a self-contained token. So if you take an OPAC token, um, we have to uh, talk to an authorized endpoint to validate an OPAC token. But if you take a JWT token, it is a self-contained token. We can simply uh, use, we can simply uh, validate uh, the signature uh, for uh, authentication. We don't need to uh, contact or we don't need to talk to uh, the authorized server uh, for authentication purposes. Uh, so we have another question. Uh, so the question is uh, where client credential token is suitable most. So basically client credentials uh, is uh, used for uh, client application uh, so for for then for authorizing client application only so basically uh, the client uh, credential is suitable for service to service communications where there is no engagement with end user yeah uh, so we have other questions can you show how uh, authentic authentication uh, authentication is sent to microservice back in uh, this JWD can be customized uh, so the question is for whether the JWD sent to back in can be customized so the answer is yes so basically we have a, a JWD generator which is uh, a configurable class uh, so if you want to generate if you most if you want to customize the JWT sent to the back end you just need to extend the existing extend that text in generator and uh, do the customization as you wish hi uh, we have another question uh, on uh, the question is uh, how to install the api manager and authentication server on local machines uh, yes yeah you can do it and documentation is available on our official documentation site so we have another question on uh, the use case we discussed before. We have a Bob role assigned uh, as user store manager. So uh, yeah, you can uh, you can log into uh, the Carbon console of API Manager. Uh, I would. So if you look at the Bob user, if you uh, we the user roles here, I have assigned uh, the relevant role. Uh, uh, the other another question can API gateway to be integrated with identity server so the answer is yes so basically uh, we can support uh, so we uh, in WSO2 API manager we have uh, the WSO2 identity server as uh, so it, it can be uh, integrated as the key manager or the authentication server and um, so other than that there we can support third party authorized third party key manager as key managers as well so there are extensions already available to support those uh, integrations as well uh, so there's another question uh, are there any inbuilt mediators for preventing security attacks like sql injection in am3 so the answer uh, answer is yes so we have uh, a set of uh, so we say that uh, so we specify like uh, um, Custom custom mediation policies. So those mediation policies are available so that you can just uh, select them from the API publisher for an uh, for an for a particular API you wish, so that the the SQL injections attacks can be prevented using those. Uh, those actually that uh, it is uh, based on regex matching, so it can be enabled. Uh, so that's a graph coil question as well. 
So is GraphQL supported in previous versions of APIM than 3.0? Uh, so basically, the uh, GraphQL is an, again another types of uh, um, types of REST API. So that is actually supported, but uh, we don't have a specific uh, specific uh, features in GraphQL before 3.0. I mean, I mean, uh, in 3.0 there are there are, there's a rich set of features which comes along with GraphQL. So representing GraphQL is true and uh, creating GraphQL APIs in publishers, but those features were not available before API Manager 3. Okay, so we have some other questions, but uh, due, due to time limitations, we won't be able to answer all of them. So we will uh, we will reply them uh, personally. So uh, I think uh, it's all for today webinar. So thank you for joining. Uh, so we would like to uh, invite you to uh, uh, follow up uh, the, the join uh, the upcoming webinar series as well. Okay, thank you.